This is the seventh Sunday of Easter, and it's also Memorial Day Sunday, which is our call to worship today. We come before God not to glorify war, but to honor and celebrate those who walked into the chaos and evil that is war. Those who were civilians and those who were military. Those who braved the censure of society and those who gave of themselves for that society. Those who survived and those who did not. Those who were friends and those who were enemies. None who have waded through evil, death and sorrow are untouched in body, mind or spirit. They are beloved of God. We are all affected and changed by the Korean War, the war in Vietnam, the war on terror, Iraq and Afghanistan. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O oh Lord Almighty, remember those who lived and died fighting to protect the dignity and the freedom of mankind. Let our spirits be proud of them. Let our hearts be compassionate and our minds clear and determined to give them honor and respect. And let us be dependent on the loving kindness of the Lord our God. As we remember the departed, let us be true soldiers of war and in peace. Let us be courageous protectors and true guardians of freedom. Let us be the true masters of brotherly love. O oh Lord, guide us in the way of moral responsibility. Enlighten us, who are true believers in ethics and justice. Let this day be a day of commemoration and honor to those who sacrifice their lives and honor to give us liberty and our nation's security. Remember them, O oh Lord, in your mercy, and have compassion on us. Make us a generation of wisdom, discipline, and faith, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, Elder Bob, for reminding us again of what Memorial Day is about. It's a solemn remembering of those who gave up even their own lives for, for us to even freely worship like this. So we thank God for that. We thank God for the sacrifice. And I thank God because of all the days, most appropriately, Today, I, we have the blessing of having my dear friend Paul um, join us today. Now, um, just a little bit of story of how we ended up here. So I think maybe seven years ago, around seven years ago, as our family had left our Korean church to be intentional about being, um, uh, being our local church, being our mission field, and local neighborhoods being our mission field, we began looking at all the churches around us in Topsfield. We ended up in this beautiful little church in Haverhill where I met this, um, this person. And it was so funny. It seemed like we had some little parallel path of our walk because <clears throat> he was also, at the time, I think you were a bank officer at that time, were you? That's right. That's right. So we met through our business networks and, and met together, right? And then uh, and he was a loan officer. I was, you know, I was just le I just left being a lawyer in some ways, and all these different things that are going on. And the Lord kept us in touch with each other through our entirety of our journey as I progressed from lawyer to being in a city mission uh, work to seminary to becoming a pastor here at this church, and him going from loan officer to what was that other thing that you were doing? Like it was like a leverage credit. A anyway, a bit. Yeah, very, uh, finance, uh, finance to becoming a pastor, and uh, and I, you know, he would tell me excited about his mission trips to Nepal, and and becoming part of this global international, like a global mission, that he was part of. And the next thing I know, he and his family is basically now committed to move as missionaries into Nepal to help them build churches there. And so, what an amazing journey that the Lord has privileged us to be in it together. Because uh, if we're talking about Memorial Day, what we're really commemorating are people and individuals who sacrificed all the way unto death. So they gave up everything for the sake of who? For others. That's what Memorial uh, Day is, right? 
And in some ways, though missionaries are not soldiers in the same sense, they are also on a mission. That's why they're called missionaries, right? And they give up everything that they have, including the things that we normally take for granted that our family should have. They let go. And they go on this mission to love others for the sake of others they are willing to give up everything and we know of many missionary stories who have given up their lives I'm not saying that that's gonna happen to Paul and his family <laughs> so uh, when we met recently together I asked Paul whether he would be willing and interested in in coming and preaching to us and he said yes and here he is so without further ado I'd like to introduce you and let us give, give him a warm round of welcome for Paul Miller Push the right button here. All right. Wow. Yeah, it is a joy to be here. And yeah, I think it's been at least seven years, if not almost ten at this point. It's, it's been a long time. But uh, we are just, I am just thrilled to be here. I was just uh, really, really encouraged to, to have this opportunity. And I got to say, um, of all the churches that I've visited and that I've spoken at, I think you guys win the award for the best welcome time ever. <laughs> I might bring this back to my church in Haverhill and say, we need to incorporate this. This was just, I've never felt so welcomed <laughs> and loved, and it's just such a, a warm, warm time, and I'm very grateful for that. So uh, let's, uh, let's pray first before we jump in, and, uh, and we'll get started here. Heavenly Father, this is your word. Your word wrapped up in one person, Jesus. It is precious to us. It speaks to us. It directs our life. It changes our hearts. It transforms us into the very image of our King. And all of your blessings wrapped up in Jesus are found in this word that we can know you and know him so intimately. And so, Lord, it's in this word, Lord, that I ask you to come. Minister to the hearts of those here. Anoint my words, Lord, to penetrate the hearts here for your glory, for their joy, and all that Christ is. For it's in him, Lord, that we have life and our breath, and our being. And it's our heart's desire to see him known and worshipped and glorified to the ends of the earth. And so with that, Lord, come. Speak through me. And do in the hearts of those here what you will do, Lord, to draw them closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. So the, uh, the term, <clears throat> excuse me, the term blessing is not an uncommon phrase in our world. Uh, many of us as Christians have heard this term used all throughout our Christian lives. Uh, it carries with it many different connotations. Many have associated it with kind of a prayer of some sort of divine infusion into our lives. Uh, we seek God to bless our lives with anything from material wealth to physical health to spiritual enhancement to greater comfort and deeper joy. Uh, anyone familiar with the Roman Catholic Church is certainly familiar with the act of blessing that a priest or bishop performs on people or objects. You know, when he does the sign of the cross on, on, from shoulder to shoulder, head to chest. I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church, so I remember this all throughout my life growing up. Many seek the blessing of those in authority as a, as a means of, of approval. Uh, maybe a young lover seeks the blessing of the father of the woman that he wants to marry. If you've watched any significant amount of Christian broadcasting on our TVs, surely you have seen the image that the blessing of God brings exorbitant wealth 
er earthly comforts and luxuries. I mean, many televangelists that you will see on these stations make millions upon millions upon millions of dollars and proclaim that if your faith is as strong as theirs, then you too could have the blessings of God that they received. In many parts of the world, blessing is simply thought of as some sort of magical force. A genie in a bottle, if, if you will. Through which someone can obtain whatever benefit or whatever they desire. In this case, blessing is not much more than luck or good fortune. I know in Nepal, you can go to any of the Hindu temples and you can go to the priest and ask for a blessing with the hope that it brings you good fortune. You know, or there's a goddess in Kathmandu, a young girl, they call her the living goddess. And if she looks at you, just looks at you, you're considered blessed. So what then is this blessing? What is blessing? What is the blessing of God as we see in the scriptures? Because it's very confused in our, in our day today. And so it's with this in mind that we're going to go to Genesis chapter 12. We're looking at verses uh, 1 through 3. I think I told you 2 through 3. Sorry about that. But if you have your Bibles with you, uh, we're looking at the whole verse, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 3. And it reads, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this, this wonderful text is a turning point in the book of Genesis. In chapter 11, just one chapter before, we have just finished reading the story of the Tower of Babel, where man, in his sinfulness, is seeking to make a name for himself and is cursed by God and is scattered throughout the earth, all with their own languages. What we see in Genesis 11 is the first city in the Bible and the first glimpse into what is biblical Babylon, which plays a role all throughout the Old Testament. It's the picture of what a kingdom created by man, without God, driven by sinfulness and rebellion, looks like. It's what a kingdom without God looks like. And this text, is com or Genesis 12, is coming to us with this background in mind. It's the background of humankind being under divine judgment. That's where we leave off at the end of chapter 11. Then chapter 12 comes. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere, God calls upon Abram to leave his country, his people, and his family to go to an unknown land. God summons Abram into a relationship with him. And then God makes an amazing promise to him. And this promise comes in light of a curse on mankind just one chapter before. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what went through Abram's mind at this point. Let's stop and think about this for a moment. How would you react? Try to imagine how Abram explains this to his wife. I'm out in the field, and all of a sudden the Lord shows up. And he tells us to leave everything we know. Our kindred, our country. The scriptures are really silent on his reaction for the most part. But what we do know from the scriptures is this, that Abram believed that God would do these things. God speaks a blessing on his creation, and it will come to pass. This is God's doing. This the entire promise is riddled with I wills and I shall. From God with virtually no requirement and no initiation from Abram. This verse paints a picture of the work of a sovereign and loving God who blesses Abram not because of any merit or worth of his own, but simply out of pure grace and sovereign purpose. And God makes a promise to him that he will be a great nation one day through God's blessing. And Abram is to carry that blessing 
wherever he goes and to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. God makes this promise and Abram believes him. Later on in Genesis, after Abram's name has been changed to Abraham, it tells us that Abraham's faith in God's promises are counted to him as righteousness. He believes God. And because of his faith in God's promises, God says, righteous. It is a model for the relationship with God that carries through to the New Testament, ultimately to the ends of the earth. Abraham, or Abraham's faith, Abraham's faith is counted to him as righteousness. It is the beginning of the promise that will bring God and man into reconciliation, and he does so through his blessing. And the people of the world will be blessed as well if they share in his blessing, in Abram's blessing. And in order for the whole world to share in that blessing, Abram must share it with the whole world. Further on in chapter 22 and, and other places in between 12 and 22, God repeats his promise to Abraham, but with even greater detail. There's an additional piece that God's, God adds in chapter 22, and he says, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. But here, God's promise to Abraham does not stop at blessing Abraham alone. God promises that Abraham's offspring will multiply as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore. We live near the beach. We can get a picture of what this looks like. You can go up to Plum Island and see all the sands, and you see what, what Abraham saw. Yet, God again states that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through God, blessing him. Abraham and his descendants will be a conduit of God's blessings. Now, from these promises in Genesis 12 and 22 and all the ones in between that are very similar to this, we see that God is completely committed to the mission of blessing the nations through the agency of Abraham's family. It's all throughout Genesis. It is a confirmation of God's original purposes that go all the way back to creation in Genesis 1. God's desire is for the whole earth to be blessed, and Abraham is the beginning of the fulfillment of God's original intent. Throughout the whole story of Abraham, God makes several promises to him. I think before we continue, we should help to summarize the blessings that God promises. First, God promises Abraham a family of descendants that will be larger than the sands of the seashore and the stars of the skies. We see this in Genesis 12 and 13, 15, 17, 18, 22. God, does, God even goes beyond that and says, not only will you have this many descendants, but I'm going to give you a land that you will call home, that all of these descendants will one day possess. Second, he also blesses Abraham with righteousness. God justifies Abraham because of his faith and trust in God's promises. Abraham has done nothing to earn God's favor as it relates to any good works. Up until Genesis 12, he's a moon worshiper. He's done nothing to earn God's favor. And God tells Abraham that he will have a son, even though he is way too old to have a child. Abraham does not do anything to act for God. God is about to act for Abraham. And God counts it to him as righteousness when Abraham says, I believe you. And that one day, Abraham stands before God, God will say, righteous, because of his faith in God's promises. God, and the third, God tells Abraham that this blessing promised to him will be enjoyed someday by all the families of the earth. God's purpose is to bless the whole world with the blessings of Abraham. He is to be a conduit, not a cul-de-sac of God's blessing. When God says, I will bless you and make your name great, he tells Abraham that I am doing this so that you will be a blessing. And it's right on the screen here. So that you will be a blessing. 
Therefore, even though God has begun his redemptive work with a single individual, he has in view the entire world. All the nations on earth. He has a plan, a clear purpose for all of the centuries ahead. And it reaches even to us now, as we'll see in a moment. We see a distinct glimpse of this blessing of the nations unfold with the story of Joseph in Genesis 41. We don't need to turn there. I'm just going to go through the story real quick. God gives Joseph, which is Abraham's great-grandson, an interpretation of a dream that predicts a seven-year famine. When that famine came, verse 41 in, in uh, chapter 41 says that the famine was severe over all the earth. Joseph, who had been blessed by God with wealth and power, had risen to power and was now in a position to extend that blessing to the nations of the earth. And verse 57 tells us that all the people of the earth came to buy grain from Joseph. Several chapters later, in chapter 47, these same people proclaimed to Joseph, you have saved our lives. What a beautiful picture this is. Severe famine reaching to the ends of the earth. Devastation, hunger, God's chosen one enduring rejection by his brothers, imprisoned, then being blessed in order to be a blessing to the nations. Does this image point to another that does the same thing later in scriptures? I think it does. Joseph, through the blessing of God, brings life-giving sustenance to a famished earth. He has been blessed abundantly, not because he has done anything of himself, but by the pure grace of God so that he may bring glory to God through blessing other nations. What we learn from these stories in Genesis is this, that the blessing of God is the unmerited, unearned, unadulterated, pure grace by which God gives an empowerment to be fruitful. All throughout the scriptures, the idea of blessing is linked directly to life flourishing. We see this in Genesis 1 to mankind and to the animals. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. He says to Jacob in Genesis 35, just after he changes his name to Israel, God blesses him and says, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. The blessing of God brings men and women into a flourishing fulfillment of what God has intended for us since the beginning of time. When blessing is fulfilled in his creation among people, households, cities, nations, they are enabled to move towards their intended destiny. It is life-giving. Blessing is God's original intent for human life on earth. Like the blessing that Joseph gave, it is a life-giving sustenance to a famished people. It is freely given, and it gives life, and it will change hearts, and it will change cities, and it will change nations. So where then do we see this most displayed in the scriptures? This life-giving sustenance to a famished people. Look at Galatians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, certainly turn there. Look at Galatians chapter 3. If not, I'm going to read it. Look at verses 7 through 9. This gets a little heavy theological, so just bear with me. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7. It says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Galatians 3, 7 through 9, and this chapter is a very, it can be a very confusing chapter. It takes a lot to dig in and understand what's going on here. But verses 7 through 9 tells us those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. They are blessed along with Abraham now. And later in verse 29, Paul tells us, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. 
heirs according to the promise. From the very beginning, God's plan was that Jesus Christ would be the descendant of Abraham and that would bring the blessing of God to all the nations of the earth. And now, everyone who trusts in Christ will be blessed as heirs of Abraham's promise. If you are Jesus, you are now a descendant of Abraham. Those of you who now hope in Christ and follow him in faith are considered Abraham's descendants. The whole meaning of the promise given to Abraham is that a multitude of nations would enjoy the blessings of being Abraham's descendant. We see that all throughout the promises in Genesis. Galatians 3 is telling us that even though we are not physically related to Abraham, through Christ we are now his descendants. He has opened the doors to being adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. And now people from every family, every people group, every nation can now be a part of Abraham's descendants by faith in Christ. Paul is telling us that the blessing given to Abraham was not only for a land, but for a great nation to fill that land. That the blessing given to Abraham was to be made right with God through faith. And that this blessing to be made righteous before God because of our faith was not just for Abraham or Israel, but for every nation on the face of the planet. And the means for that to happen, to be made right with God, to be able to stand before him and one day say, or hear the words, you are counted as righteous is through your faith in the finished work of Jesus. That's the model that we see all the way back to Genesis, Abraham believed God's promises and it was counted to him as righteous. And it's the same thing with us. We put our faith in the finished work of Christ and God says, righteous. And through that, we become part of Abraham's family. Descendants of Abraham that get the blessing that God gave to him thousands of years ago. And it doesn't just stop at righteousness either. This is a promise for a new land, a new nation under God's rule and blessing. That's what we inherit. We put our faith in Christ and receive the blessing that was made to Abraham. So what does this mean for us as believers now? What are we to do with this? It means the mandate to bless all of the nations of the earth becomes ours when we have put our faith in Christ. If the promise of God is that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's offspring, and those who are now in Christ are now considered his offspring, then the mandate to be a blessing to the whole earth is now ours. In other words, we have been blessed with the blessing of Abraham so that we will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. If the blessing of God brings life, empowerment to see creation redeemed and to see men and women reconciled to God through faith, if the blessing of God brings us into the intended uh, fulfillment of God's creation, then we know that those blessings are obtained through faith in one person. One work, one finished work, one name, Jesus Christ. That is how we get the blessing of God. It is through Christ. It is through faith in his finished work. The question now is, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth? How are we to see this promise to Abraham, all the nations on earth being blessed through the blessing that we have received? How are we to see this happen? What are we to do with this? Well, the first question we need to ask is this. Have all the nations on earth received this blessing? Can we say that they have? And if the answer to that question is no, then our job is not done. In fact, we have a picture of what this looks like 
We see it in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. You don't have to turn there, I'll, I'll read it. This is what the promise to Abraham looks like fulfilled. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10, is Genesis 12, 1 through 3, answered. It is the picture of it being fulfilled. And do you realize this, this verse in Revelation, this great multitude that no one can number from every nation and tribe and people and language, clothed in white robes, which means righteous. Do you ever stop to think that you're in that picture? When you read that verse in the Bible, when you're looking at this great multitude that John is describing, you are in that picture. It is the picture in Genesis fulfilled. That is the goal that this promise longs for. So the question remains, have all the nations of the earth received the blessing given to Abraham? The answer we all know is no. They haven't. And if we have obtained the blessing given to Abraham through our faith in Christ, what are we to do with that blessing? That's the question. What do we do with what we've received in Christ? 2012 marked the point where the world's population hit 7 billion people. And five years later, we're at 7.5 billion people. That's a lot of people. <laughs> and it's growing very quickly. 3.5 billion, that's 50% of the world's population, are Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist. Two out of three people in the world live in Asia. 70% of them have never heard the name Jesus Christ. 70%. When God speaks of all the families of the earth in Genesis, and we hear the word nations in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, make disciples of all nations, he is speaking of individual ethnic people groups. He is not talking about geopolitical states like India or Iran or Nepal. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about ethno-linguistic distinct cultures like the Navajo or the Cherokee or the Chetri in Nepal. As of yesterday, the world contains 16,584 distinct ethno-linguistic people groups. 6,700 of these people groups have never heard the gospel of Christ meaning they have never heard of or received the blessing that was given to Abraham. They are considered unreached, meaning there is no noticeable church and little to no Christians among them. And 3,200 of these people groups are considered unengaged, meaning there's no missionary engagement with the gospel at all. Many of them have no strategy to reach them. In South Asia, where our family is in the process of moving to, there are 2,679 of these people groups that are unreached, totaling 1.6 billion people. That's just in South Asia. I'm going to divert a little bit slightly here to share a bit of what we're doing in Nepal and why we are selling everything we have to go to this beautiful and complex country. In Nepal alone, there are 253 of these nations. This is a country the size of New England. 30 million people with 253 distinct ethnic groups within the borders of Nepal. 242 of these nations are considered unreached by the gospel. Nearly 29 million people. A country that is 86% Hindu, 10% Tibetan Buddhist, and where the remaining 4% are made up of Muslims, Christians, and other tribal beliefs. We've been laboring in the country there since 2014 to plant churches throughout the country and to train pastors to continue reaching these unreached people groups. 
to reach the 242 different nations that are there that have not been reached yet by the gospel of Jesus. Last night, I was speaking to one of our pastors in far west Nepal. And he's working among a people group that does not have one believer among them. Not one. This people group called the Rauti people have about 150 people among them. They have dwindled. They're slowly becoming an extinct people group. They are nomadic people. They're hard to find. They move around constantly. They're in the hills. They're in the forests. They're very difficult to find. And they do not want to be found. They don't want any outside engagement, not only just from Nepalis, but from anybody else outside of Nepal. They have their own culture, their own history, their own language, their own beliefs, their own clothes, their own food. They're monkey hunters. This is a hunting nomadic tribe. This brother traveled seven hours by bus and hiked into the mountains to find them and to tell them about this promise of God, this free gift of salvation, this amazing king who died and shed his blood on their behalf so that they too might inherit the blessings promised to Abraham thousands of years ago. And here we are working among a people who does not even have one person among them who have ever heard of or believed in the name of Jesus Christ. And this tribe has been there for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. They've never heard of or believed in the name of Jesus, and yet one day, we, as we see in Revelation 7, some from this very people, this very nation, will believe. We believe this with all of our heart. That God promised it to Abraham. He shows us in Revelation 7 that it will happen. And they will stand before God one day. And when God looks at their account to see where they stand, he will one day say, righteous. And some among those routy people will be in those white clothes giving praise and worship and saying, salvation belongs to our God. This is why we go. This is why we're willing to sell whatever we have to pick up our family of five and go to these people. We believe that Jesus died to purchase them. That the promise made to Abraham that every nation of the earth will be blessed through his offspring, which is now us through our faith in Christ. And that the picture in Revelation 7 shows us that the promise is real. The fact that you believe in Jesus right now shows that the promise is real. Jesus shed his blood to purchase some from among this nation of 150 people and some from the other 241 in Nepal and the other 7,000 throughout the entire world that do not know the king of the universe, and that he died to purchase them, to make them his adopted children, to free them from their slavery to sin, to lift them up as a kingdom who will be forever satisfied and joyous in his presence. My friends, Jesus Christ is the one blessing that will bring life, flourishing, fulfillment to all the nations. And if millions upon millions of people are going to hell and we have been given the blessing of God, then the mandate is strong. The mandate is strong to share and give of all that we have so that the nations will find life and life abundantly in Christ. After all, like I said, your faith in Jesus today is the result of someone sharing that blessing with you. And praise God that they did. Jesus Christ purchased the blessing for us in his blood so that we might make known his glory to the nations by sharing the blessing with them. We have been entrusted with the blessing of God so that we will make the greatness of his name and his glory known among the nations. So they will rejoice in the Lord, give praise to him for his grace, and have infinite joy and pleasures evermore in Christ in a new creation, that, in a new kingdom that will never end. That is what Christ has done on our behalf. And how are you sharing these blessings? That's the question. 
Are you sharing these blessings? How are you sharing them with your family, your neighbor, your city, your workplace? Are you a generous giver of this good news, of this blessing? Or are you a hoarder? Do you hold it to yourself and not share it with anybody else? The beauty of this gospel is that it takes us not only from the takers of grace of God, but turns us into givers of the abundant blessings that he gives to us. Whether it's spiritual or material blessings, all can be used to bless the nations. I'm going to close with Psalm 67. Many of you have probably heard this psalm. It is probably my favorite psalm, although I think I say that about four different ones. <laughs> I love Psalm 67. Many, many of you may have heard this at the end of a sermon. It's the benediction. But listen to the words here and see, what, see how it's connected to what we're talking about today. I'll read it. Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. There it is. Be gracious to us and bless us. Lord, shine your face upon us. Why? That your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. There it is. May God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face to shine upon us. Why? So that his way may be known throughout the whole earth and his saving power among all nations. And so that all the peoples will praise him. God has blessed you so that you may be a blessing to all the nations of the earth for their gladness and their joy in Christ, for the glory of God. And may the word of God stir you to be a radical giver, be a radical giver of these blessings that you have received. Let's pray. Oh Lord, your blessings are abundant. They are abundant, Lord. You have sacrificed your own son on our behalf. The very creator of the world, the king of the universe, who died on our behalf to bring us forgiveness so that we may be counted righteous before you. And if that wasn't enough, Lord, you have adopted us into your family. You have freed us from slavery to sin. And if that wasn't enough, you have raised us up to be co-heirs with Christ, to one day co-rule with him in a kingdom that you are creating for your people, to dwell under your reign, to live under your blessing. Lord, we have received so much, and it is secure. It is ours, simply through our faith in, in your Son. And Lord, may we take these blessings that we have, and we proclaim it to the whole earth, so that the whole earth may know you and your goodness and your glory and your beauty and your justice and your love and that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Lord, may you do this, we ask, through us here and through all the churches here in this region, Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Sometimes we get caught up in our own have-nots because we think that we have little, that we've been hurt, that we lack things. We're so caught up in our own perception of poverty that we do forget this, that we are indeed blessed. Not only are we blessed, we're blessed because the Lord is blessing others through us. How much wealth do you want? We are a blessed people, a blessed nation. Thank you, Paul, for reminding us of that.